Welcome to One on One, the Daily Item's weekly digital program featuring Susquehanna Valley newsmakers interviewed by Daily Item reporters. Today's guest is certified QPR trainer Ann Katona Lynn, interviewed by editor John Zaktansky. Sunbury Motors Ford knows many of you will be heading to the Bloomsburg Fair, so they need to sell cars now. Sunbury Motors is going to price all new Fords at a level that makes it impossible to say no. You'll be feeling great driving to the fair in a 2018 Ford Escape for only $18,820. Welcome to the Daily Items One-on-One. -on -one. I'm John Zaktansky, and today our guest is certified QPR trainer Ann Katona Lynn. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, we want to jump into uh, s this September is National Suicide Awareness Month, and we want to make sure we touch upon that. QPR, obviously, is a training involving intervention for work suicide. So mm -hmm. uh, we want to jump into that first, though. Uh, what, what kind of personal things have you so connected to the suicide beat within the area? Um, I have had a lot of personal uh, experiences, unfortunately. I've had a lot of childhood friends that actually died by suicide. Um, in the last six years, we have had five paddling friends. We do, my husband and I do kayaking and stand up paddle boarding on whitewater. And um, we've had five friends who have died by suicide. And, and it's been really difficult because it's a close knit community and a lot of people, everybody knows everyone. And so it, it really is hit the community pretty hard and, and people are wondering what is going on. Um, I have struggled with my own mental illness with post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety. Um, but I, I, you know, my goal is to be able to give people hope and to see that there is, there is light at the end of the tunnel and there is something better. Sure. Now, obviously, suicide it seems to be a topic that's all mm -hmm. over the place right now, uh, and there's so many local examples. What, how bad is the suicide epidemic, if we can call it that, in the area mm -hmm. right now? Um, and, and, well, in the United States, 99% uh, of counties uh, increased their suicide rate within the last, from 2005 to 2015, increased their suicide rate by 10% or more. And um, so, and, and in Northumberland County, the rate is 15.9 per 100,000 deaths. So 15 per nine um, are those of suicide. And uh, in Snyder County, it's 10.1 per 100,000 and Union County is 8.7 deaths per 100,000. So um, I think one of the big things is that the rates have really increased tremendously in um, in rural areas. So the highest rates are actually in rural rural parts of Pennsylvania. So um, Elk County, Wayne County, and Schuylkill County are the highest rates in Pennsylvania. And the lowest is Philadelphia, which is really interesting because I think that people don't realize, you know, they think, oh, the violence, but when it comes to suicide, that it is really a rural, a much rural, um, more rural issue. Sure. Well, you mentioned a drastic increase. What do you mm -hmm. think is behind the drastic increase? Because, I mean, I know, you know, when I was growing up as a teenager, you barely heard about the concept mm -hmm. of suicide, and now uh, it just seems to be everywhere. Yeah. And middle-aged white males have had the highest increase in rate. Um, I think a lot of it has been due to the opioid crisis that, uh, you know, some of the risk factors are just stressors. So the opioid crisis has created a lot of stress. And the challenge is, is it's really difficult to get the numbers right because a lot of times people may be taking drugs to self-medicate and may want to die, but they may die by an overdose even though they had the intention of killing themselves. Um, so it's really hard to, to find some of the numbers. And for some of those lower counties too, it's a little bit more difficult. But um, the opioid crisis, stress just in general, uh, I think the amount of stressors, um, not just personal stressors, but also the collective. Since 9-11, um, we've seen increases and, and the, the school shootings and, and a lot of violence in general. Um, one of the highest rates is also ease of access to, is the highest rate of suicide is by firearms. Um, and I think ease of access, especially if we're talking in rural areas, um, they're more likely to have access to guns. And so that's a big piece of um, why, as well as there is less access to mental health services, including stigma that prevents people from getting mental health services. So 
Um, the Hispanic and black communities actually have much lower rates of suicide as opposed to the white communities. Um, and also Native American have a lot higher rate of suicide as well. Wow. Um, obviously, there's certain misconceptions and uh, we did a series called Shattering the Stigma about suicide a couple of years ago. Um, what kind of misconceptions and, and, and inaccuracies are out there about suicide that kind of turn people off to getting the help they really need? Mm -hmm. uh, probably the biggest one is if we talk about it, then that's going to give someone an idea. Um, and that is absolutely not the case at all, is that people want to talk and want to get help, but they really are so ashamed that they don't know what to do. And, and talking is such a huge piece. Um, I think another one is that um, especially teenagers, uh, they're just doing it for attention. And, and if they say they're going to die by suicide, um, that doesn't really mean that they're going to do it. If they're talking about it, they could they could potentially be doing it. Um, only certain types of people become suicidal. So people have you know their vision of those people, um, whatever that is. But but it is a myth, and there are no demographics that are um, that are not touched by suicide. And so it really goes across everyone. Um, Every death is preventable. That's another myth. Just because yes, suicide is preventable, but Sometimes you just really don't know, um, and, and people get so good at hiding things that you don't realize. Um, and so there are just so many factors that make suicide complex. It's difficult to say that every single one is preventable. Um, once a person is committed to doing suicide, once they want to do have a suicide and they have a plan, that there's no stopping them, and that, that's not the case as well. So those were, I think those are probably some of the biggest myths around suicide. Sure. Well, we mentioned a little bit ago, I, I mentioned a little bit ago that you're a certified QPR trainer. Mm -hmm. um, how, how long have you been doing that and what exactly is QPR? So QPR is called Question, Persuade, Refer. Um, I've been a trainer for the last two and a half years and um, it is essentially CPR for mental and emotional health. So it is targeted at, at suicide, but it really can be for any type of um, mental illness or addiction, Any anybody who's struggling mentally or emotionally. I, I see um, so many of the strategies learning QPR, and this is really for the public. This is not just for people who are uh, specialists or counselors or doctors. Those people absolutely should get this information, but uh, QPR is designed to be able to share with large parts of the of, of the public, and that uh, similar to, to CPR, that we want to get everybody as many people as trained trained as possible. What kind of QPR trainings have you done in the area um, lately, uh, and how can people get access to that? Um, I have done uh, through the United Way. Uh, we did a youth event, um, so anyone who was serving youth. Uh, that was in February, I think, of this year, and that was at the IU. And that, that was, um, we had uh, coaches and Boy, Boy Scout leaders and um, some people who work in uh, group homes or a variety of different people and counselors. We had a variety of people there and paraprofessionals. So I think that um, that's one good example. Uh, I've done them also for churches uh, because churches want to help people, but again, don't always know exactly how to do that. So um, QPR is a, an hour and a half to two hour training that is available uh, through the Garrett Lee Smith uh, state grant. It's a federal grant at the state level, um, as well as McDowell Institute at Bloomsburg University. There are many QPR trainers now being trained across the state. So they're being offered um, really almost for free, maybe just for the materials uh, on a regular basis across the state. So I would say uh, Prevent Suicide PA is one place to go, and also McDowell, the McDowell Institute at Bloomsburg University, uh, as well as the United Way, that they can, some, those are some of the, the, the key places where you can find out more about QPR training. Okay, sounds good. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in a moment. 
Sunbury Motors has to sell seven new Fords every day from now till the Bloomsburg Fair. Pack up the family in your 2018 Explorer. Explorers start under 30 grand at SMC, and they have 20 to choose from. Every Edge, Focus, Fusion, Fiesta, Echo Sport will be discounted for SMC to sell seven new Fords every day from now till the fair. Welcome back. This is John Zaktansky with The Daily Item, and with us is Ann Katona Lynn, uh, certified QPR trainer. Uh, jumping back into the conversation, and um, mm-hmm. what are some signs? I mean, let, let's say you have a friend who seems down, who seems a little uh, off, so to speak. Uh, what, what, at what point do, do you think someone should intervene? At what point should someone do something? Mm-hmm. I mean, we all have days that we, we may struggle a little bit, but the key is, is if you see them really change their regular routines, if you see changes in, um, in their habits, such as eating or um, their clothing, and they, that maybe they're not taking a shower as often, um, maybe they're eating more, they're eating less, maybe they stop going to church or they start going to church. Um, they could be giving away some of their prized possessions and, and you know, things especially that you know that they would really care about and giving them away or telling people things, um, you know, such as, you, you, I, you know, I, I, I just want you to know that you're a good friend of mine, you've been a good friend of mine. And, and not that that's a bad thing, but again, when you look at a lot of these things individually, um, and, and it, you know, again, you see crying or some, some of those emotional pieces like that, or if there's been a major life event. But when you look at all of these things together, that's the key. It's not any one piece in isolation. Um, that's why it's so important for people to communicate uh, with each other. I think that that's this is why breaking the stigma and allowing us all to talk about mental illness and, and just mental emotional struggles and talk about suicide openly, that that's going to help with identifying some of those missed signals. Sure. Now, in a recent interview, we talked about this topic, and you mentioned specifically uh, the concept that if someone is overindulging in a favorite activity, you mentioned mm-hmm. paddling. Obviously, mm-hmm. paddling is a positive activity, mm-hmm. uh, but another sign or symptom may be someone who overindulges in that type of an activity. Absolutely. If they are maybe self-medicating, um, maybe having riskier behaviors, um, you know, and, and, and I think about that and, and so many things that we do are a little bit more risky. But again, when you take that into um, the larger context and look at those pieces uh, with maybe they're having some struggles at home, um, you know, having those communications are really critical. But yeah, absolutely. Good things can become addictive if they are using it to escape their emotions. And I think that's really the key is that um, we need to make sure, and I know for us as paddlers, we try to make sure we connect with everybody as much as possible and really talk about the difficult things and share our own stories of struggles because um, not everything is perfect and we need to be able to talk about it. Well, talking leads into where I want to go next is mm-hmm. how do you start that conversation? You see someone who's struggling. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's obviously probably pretty scary to so walk up to someone and mm-hmm. say, hey, what's going on? Uh, mm-hmm. what, how do you uh, recommend we start a conversation with someone who we feel might be struggling? Yeah, the key is we really want to talk about it directly, but we don't want to go to a place where, um, you know, we we're going to shut them down. Like, oh, you're just acting poorly what's wrong with you you just seem so miserable you know so we want to avoid doing those things but we want to say hey i've noticed i've noticed some of these things that you've changed a little bit and i've noticed that you've been doing this a little bit more and you seem a little bit more down and your facebook posts seem to be a little bit more depressing are you okay I, i really care about you and i want to make sure that i am here to support you and that if you ever need anything so can we talk about that a little bit more? That's kind of an opening, you know, and then from there you can go a little bit further to get them, you know, just, just really the biggest thing is to listen, just let them talk and talk to them non-judgmentally and let them just share. Uh, because a lot of times just asking that question can open up a huge door and them being able to share and feel safe. That's another critical piece. Um, that's that's a, the first step into really, really getting help. Sure. Um, and then once you get a sense that somebody might need help, how do you take that next leap to get someone who might already be self-conscious about mm-hmm. their uh, their concerns and, and to take them to a point where that you can persuade them to get help? How do you mm-hmm. do that persuade part? The key is is really, again, letting them know 
that you really care about them. That's critical. No matter what part of the process you're in, you have to always really let them know, like, look, I love you. I want you or I care about you, whatever your relationship is. I want to make sure that you're okay. So can we talk about some options for maybe, um, you know, getting help? Are you willing to get help? Um, one of the key things, too, when we're, when we're talking in that phase, we want to ask them, do you, do you want to die by suicide or do you want to hurt yourself? Do you want to kill yourself? Uh, we want to avoid saying commit because that sounds more like a sin, but we really want to focus on um, are, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Do you want to do that? And do you have a plan? Those are the, the two key questions that we want to make sure that we're asking people so that we can really get to the root of the problem. That's where the persuade comes in. But again, non judgmentally, letting them know we care and we're there to help them um, and that we want to do whatever we possibly can. That may mean that we may not be, if, even if we can't do something right away, we want to think about. I want to get you help. Let's connect with this person. Is there or asking them, is there anyone that you really care about that that you know maybe you don't feel comfortable talking to me as much? Who do you feel that you you know who do you trust that you really can talk to? Um, and let's go see if we could find them or let's call them. You know, really kind of doing those things right in the moment rather than you know kind of letting them go. Sure. And you mentioned a couple things already as far as what not to do, like not to use mm -hmm. the word commit. Are there any other things um, that we should try to stay away from to kind of, that would might impede uh, that mm -hmm. person getting help? You know, it, it's really making judgmental statements like, oh, you're, you're just such a drama queen or, you know, you're just doing this for attention. And, um, you know, I don't really believe. I think you're just trying to get out of doing, uh, you know, of, of managing your responsibilities or, you um, you're trying to get sympathy. Uh, those are all things that we really don't want to say. The, the, the key is, um, you know, and, and another one is not making them feel guilty. So not saying to them, can you, can you even think about what your family, how much they are going to suffer if you do this? That really is, is they're, they're already thinking about that their family may be better off without them. And so to kind of trigger that is, again, we don't want to put shame on people. Mm -hmm. um, that's not going to be effective. Uh, they need hope. And that's the absolute most critical thing is that they need to know that there is a place to get help. And it may not happen overnight that, that they're going to get better. Um, but there are different things to, to do to get help. And that 80% of people who actually do get help for mental health issues um, see results and see see oh, improvement. I know in my own life and in my family's life, we've had tremendous results, so. Good. Uh, we talked about the cue, the questioning, and of course the conversation. We talked about the P, the persuade, the referral part. How, how do we go about, about the steps of getting someone the help they need and what locally is there um, mm -hmm. when it comes to making a referral and getting someone help? Uh, there are a lot more, um, a lot more resources now. Uh, Prevent Suicide PA is a website that has a lot of resources uh, and you can find local resources from there. Another option is to dial 211. Uh, which is through the United Way now, and it's it's kind of like a 911 for everything else other than physical um, emergencies, so that you can at least get connected with someone to find out where you can get some support. There are also crisis hotlines for Northumberland County and then Snyder Union, um, uh, Montour, and Columbia also have a hotline as well. So those are other places, but local human services, um, even, you know, you can go to a church or go to a family friend and Google things. A lot of it you can, you can do, you know, you can find things by Google. Uh, another key thing is the uh, text line. So if anyone is struggling, uh, the, the text line, if you want to uh, text for suicide help or any emotional help is 741741, especially when we're talking youth because it may not be as comfortable to talk on the phone. So allowing them to be able to text with somebody may be a little bit more comfortable sure, for them. Sure. Uh, and, and we a lot of this interview obviously has been talking about someone who wants to intervene for somebody else. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who might be watching this episode who might be struggling themselves as mm -hmm. far as the importance mm -hmm. of getting help and the importance of, uh, of uh, why they should take that step and why that there's a light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, I think probably one of the key things is that I have had my own struggles 
um, and my family, we've had a lot of struggles in our family. And taking that first step is the hardest step. But once you take that step and start having the conversations, the other side has so much freedom. It may not always be easy along the way, but it truly is a freedom where you can feel healing and, and feel better than you ever have before. For me, I know I've been able to use what I've learned um, and what I've kind of battled, all the struggles that I've had, to be able to help others. And to me, that's extremely empowering. So to think that something that you can do can really help someone else is tremendously powerful. Sure. And we're just and about, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, we're it's just okay. about out of time. One last quick question. Uh, what kind of ripple effect can suicide have mm. on those left behind? Uh, the what ifs, the doubts, the, the, yeah. the mis miscues, maybe uh, that type of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. They think, what did I miss? Could I have stopped this? And, and the guilt and the shame just can be really tremendous. Um, you know, and they even say, well, I did talk to them about them and I did tell them to get help and I did all those things. But, you know, again, it's so complex. You can't say that every single suicide is preventable. But, um, you know, the more that we are aware, the, the better. Um, I think probably one uh, final piece is that we have to be aware of that people who have experienced suicide by someone else in their family or close friends, they are at higher risk of, of suicide themselves. Wow. So we've got to really be aware of that and, sure. and create support. Great. Well, that's all for today. Thank you very much. Again, I'm John Zaktansky with The Daily Adam, and this is Ann Katuna Lynn. Thanks again, Ann, for being with us today, and I uh, look forward to uh, checking in next week. Thanks for watching One on One. We hope you'll come back next Thursday for another edition.